Hi. You want to wait? <laughs> yeah. Yes. I need to tell people what's going on this morning because we're going to do some strange stuff this morning. Uh, thank you, Chris, for already setting the tone uh, because we're talking about Jonah. We're talking about the whole book. And you need to know a couple of things before we get into the scripture and the sermon. First of all, Jonah is funny. It's meant to be funny. It's written in an over-the-top, almost parable-like kind of way. There are things that you should find ridiculous and absurd and extreme. Be looking for those. That's, that's important. The other thing to know this morning is that we are going to do Jonah in four different sections. There are four different chapters, each of which basically have their own theme. So what's going to happen is that we're going to have one person read a chapter of Scripture, and then I will respond to that or talk about that, and then back and forth and so on. So without further ado, let's hear Jonah chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid his fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, And such a mighty storm came upon the sea that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried to his God. They threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. Jonah, meanwhile, had gone down into the hold of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. The captain came and said to him, What are you you doing, sound asleep? Get up and call your God. Perhaps the God will spare us a thought so that we do not perish. The sailors said to one another, Come, let us cast lots so that we may know on whose account this calamity has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us why this calamity has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where have you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? I'm Hebrew, he replied. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were even more afraid and said to him, What is this that you've done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them so. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea was growing more and more tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that the great storm has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard, to bring the ship back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more stormy against them. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, O Lord, we pray, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not make us guilty of innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked Jonah up and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord even more. And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Jonah is a prophet. The main job of a prophet is to go to people who are going down the wrong path of life, to tell them that they are going down the wrong path, and to get them to repent and tell them to come back to God. And if they don't, uh, to tell them what sort of destruction or difficulties are going to be coming their way. Now, if the people take, jo- take the prophet seriously and they start repenting, well, then all of the gloom and doom and destruction that was coming their way gets called off. That is the main job of a prophet, to preach God's judgment and to get people to repent. So Jonah, or God comes to Jonah, the prophet, and tells him to go prophesy against the city of Nineveh and get them to repent. Jonah, on the other hand, goes off or sets off for the city of Tarshish. A geography lesson is in order here to understand what this really means. Jonah is probably in a uh, Jewish city or a city in northern Israel called Beth Hefer, and Nineveh is to the east in modern day northern Iraq. 
found out something kind of interesting, actually, about Nineveh as I was researching this. Um, if you've paid attention to the news, particularly the news of the war in Iraq over the last five or ten years, there's a city in northern Iraq where a lot of key battles have happened called Mosul. Mosul is Nineveh. It's, it's the same town. The, the ruins of the old ancient city of Nineveh are right in the middle. Kind of interesting. Anyways, that's where Nineveh is. It's to the east of, of Israel. Tarshish is not. Tarshish is most likely a city called Tartessus, which is in Spain. <laughs> yeah, on the other side of the Mediterranean Sea. So here we have a situation where God tells Jonah, a prophet, to basically go do his job and preach to the city of Nineveh, and instead he attempts to run away to a city that is three times as far in the other direction, away from Nineveh. Which raises the question, why would he do that? Why would he risk life and limb to run away from what God wants him to do? Well, see, remember here that God has told him to go preach to the Ninevites, which means he needs to tell them the destruction that is coming their way and get them to repent, after which ultimately God would spare them. And that, that right there is the problem, really, because Jonah doesn't want them to repent. Jonah does not want them to be spared. Jonah wants God to wipe the Ninevites off of the face of the earth, because Jonah hates the Ninevites. Jonah hates them so bad that he would rather die than see the city of Nineveh repent and be saved. So, again, why does Jonah hate them so badly? Well, there's a couple of possible reasons as to why the hatred of Nineveh would be legitimate. The first of which is that, well, this is not just some Assyrian city. This is the capital of the Assyrian Empire. During the time of Jonah in ancient Israel, the Assyrians were the big dogs in the Middle East. They were the ones who controlled pretty much everything. Their empire kept people subjugated and, and down by some very brutal kinds of ways. A couple, uh, about 150 years ago, they excavated the, the, the temple or the, the king's palace in the city of Nineveh, and they found a bunch of these, well, they're called reliefs or friezes. Basically, they're carved scenes of different events throughout the Assyrian Empire. And in a number of those, there are some pretty amazing images of the Assyrians dominating different groups of people and doing some pretty awful things. One in particular has to do with the Jewish city of Lachish, which is a city that the Assyrians conquered and is actually recorded in the biblical text. But in this Assyrian temple, there is a scene of the Assyrians taking, well, basically naked Jewish people that they had, um, that they had defeated and impaling them on poles and setting them up around the city and, and doing things like taking Jewish slaves and making them uh, build implements of war and then use them against their own people. These are not exactly nice guys. They did some pretty brutal things, and at least for the people of Israel, they were in constant conflict with the Assyrians. Jonah has some reasonably good reasons to hate the Assyrians, and Nineveh in particular. Nineveh, in fact, throughout the whole Old Testament, every instance of Nineveh, except for Jonah, is one of condemnation. They are the perpetual evil city. In fact, the entire book of Nahum, which is a short book, but still the entire book of Nahum is essentially an oracle condemning the city of Nineveh and saying how God is going to completely destroy it in some equally awful ways. Now, the thing about this is, yes, Jonah has some reasons to not like the Ninevites. But again, it still seems a little bit extreme as to what he did. He traveled three times as far in the other direction. He tried to go 2,000 miles away from where God wanted him to do when he is the guy that should be doing this kind of thing. It's over the top here. And that over the topness leads us to one of the first ironies in this story, which is that Jonah's job is to go tell people that they are going in the wrong direction and that they need to turn back to God. 
And Jonah literally goes in the wrong direction (laughs) and is the one who needs to turn back to what God wants him to do. And so Jonah gets on this boat, starts heading out to sea. God sends this huge storm. And you've got all of these sailors who start freaking out and saying, okay, whose God did we make mad? We've got to figure this one out. Um, Everybody get up. Let's start start sacrificing. Do whatever we've got to do. Let's figure it out. And then Jonah basically gets up and said, oh, yeah, my bad. Uh, that, it was me. It's, I know what's happening. So, hey, how about you guys just throw me over and kill me? Like I said, he would rather die than go preach to Nineveh. And so they oblige him and throw him overboard to what is most likely his certain death, at which point the storm calms. Interestingly, it is worth noting that the sailors who are worshiping other gods at the beginning of this, by the end of it, have essentially converted. They start making sacrifices to Yahweh and making vows to Jonah's God. For them, it is a conversion story. Jonah, on the other hand, is sinking quickly to the bottom of the ocean. Let's see how that turns out. Jonah 1, 17 to 2, 10. But the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to God, to, then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the sea, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. How shall I look again upon your holy temple? The waters closed in over me. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever, yet you brought me my life from the pit. O Lord my God, as my life was ebbing away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayers came to you into your holy temple. Those who worship vain idols forsake their true loyalty, but I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed I will pay. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. Then the Lord spoke to the fish, and it spewed Jonah up on the dry land. I know the fish gets most of the press, but I'll try and make this as clear and as simple as I can. The story of Jonah is not about a man being swallowed by a fish. Not about the fish. If you caught up on whether or not that actually happened, you are missing the point of this entire story. The fish takes up two verses, one at the beginning of chapter 2 and one at the, be- at the end of chapter 2. That's it. The point of the fish in this story, however, is rather significant. The point of the fish is to show two things. First of all, that God is able to save Jonah, which, again, is ironic considering that if Jonah just would have done what God told him to do, he wouldn't be in that problem in the first place. The second thing is that the purpose of the fish is to make sure that Jonah doesn't weasel out of what God commanded him to do. Jonah tries to get himself killed, run in the other direction, and yet God is saying, look, I'm going to make you go to the city of Nineveh if I've got to send a giant fish to drag you back to the shore and spit you up out on the beach. That's the point of the big fish in this story which seems to be fairly effective because Jonah gets the message and starts heading to Nineveh. Let's see how that goes. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. 
And he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, and covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. Then he had a proclamation made in Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. No human being or animal, nor herd or flock, shall taste anything. They shall not feed, nor shall they drink water. Human beings and animals shall be covered with sackcloth, and they shall cry mightily to God. All shall turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. <clears throat> Again, Jonah is a funny story. There's a lot of things that are over the top and exaggerated in this story. Jonah attempts to run 2,000 miles in the wrong direction from God. There's a giant fish that's eat, eat, that eats him. Nineveh is a three-day walk across, which no city in that day would have ever even been close to that big. Jonah, later on, as we'll find out, sounds like an illogical four-year-old having a temper tantrum in Walmart at a couple of points. There, there are things that are way, way over the top, and perhaps the most over-the-top thing is, Joan, or is the city of Nineveh repenting. This is a ridiculous kind of scene here. First of all, we're not just talking about an Assyrian city. We're talking about the Assyrian city, the capital of Nineveh. This is where the king of the Assyrian Empire resides. And Jonah walks in and says, yeah, in 40 days you're going to be destroyed. And the whole city repents? Never mind the fact that there's no historical evidence for that. That's a little bit amazing and extreme. It's maybe hyperbolic. More amazing, though, is the way that they repent. Jonah walks in, preaches his gloom and doom message, and everybody starts repenting as hard and as fast as they possibly can. Now, a couple of things to remember here. The way that you repented in that culture and in that day and age was by doing two things, essentially. One was putting on uh, a burlap sack and covering yourself in ashes, sort of a self-punishment kind of thing, and then also fasting, which means you didn't eat or you didn't drink, which was essentially and is still a way to draw closer to God. Anyways, those are the public ways that you repented when you had gone off track and you were trying to get favor with God. Now, the funny thing about this story is when you look at the decree that the king put out. Jonah walks out, walks into the city, says you need to repent, and everybody starts repenting immediately as fast as they can. Word gets to the king, and the king sends out a decree to the whole city of Nineveh, probably the whole kingdom, saying everybody, big and small, everybody from your little kids to the old people, everybody's got to repent, put on sackcloth and ashes, and, and don't eat or drink anything, and just to be safe, make sure your animals don't do any of that either. Can you imagine trying to get a herd of sheep covered in sackcloth and ashes and keep them from grazing? <laughs> this is funny. This is a hilarious scene. It is extreme. It is over the top. And... It works. <laughs> it works. God sees the Ninevites doing this and spares them. God sees them change their ways, and God does not bring the destruction that God had planned. Let's see what Jonah thinks of that. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and, re and ready to relent from punishing. 
And now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when, when, down came, when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, is it better for me to die it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, Yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, You are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh that great city in which there are more than 120,000 people and who do not know their right hand from their left and also their animals. Again, chapter 4 opens with this humorous scene. Nineveh is spared, and Jonah is so mad that he comes unglued. He says to God, I told you, I told you this was going to happen. I knew that I was going to go preach to them and that they were going to repent and that you wouldn't, we wouldn't take them out. You were a merciful God. I knew it. I knew you were going to spare them. But I did one of those people in Nineveh wipe, wiped off the face of the planet, but no, you had to go be merciful and spare them. You know what? I can't even stand that Nineveh exists and I still exist. You know what? God, just kill me right now. I don't even want to be on this earth anymore. At which point God says, really? <laughs> really? You have, you have any right to be mad about this? At which point Jonah goes and pouts. I love that scene. He goes outside of the city and sits down and makes a tent. And we'll wait for things to happen. He's just mad. I know what pouting looks like. I've got a kid. <laughs> At which point, God decides to teach Jonah a little bit of a lesson. So God sends this little plant. Remember, we're in the desert here. God sends this little plant, makes this nice little shade for Jonah. And he's happy for a day. He's glad about the plant. Next morning, worm comes, eats the roots out of the plant, withers away, and God makes sure it's extra hot that day. Real hot, nice blast furnace east wind. Things are nice and miserable. And Jonah's lying there thinking he's going to faint and says, oh, God, this is so horrible. Just kill me now. And again, God says, Jonah, do you have any right to be angry about the bush? And then Jonah actually says, yes. So angry I could die. <laughs> if the Ninevites are over the top in their repenting, Jonah is equally as over the top in his anger at God and his anger that the Ninevites have been spared. But it's after that response by Jonah that we actually get to the whole point of this entire story, this entire book. After the scene where Jonah is angry about this plant coming up and, and leaving, God comes to Jonah and says, Jonah, you're concerned about this plant that you didn't plant, you didn't make it grow, you didn't water it. It came up in a day and went in a day. But look at Nineveh. There's 120,000 people there that are so lost that they don't know their right hand from their left. Should I not be concerned about them? And after God asks that question, well, it ends. 
The story ends with that question never being answered. Now we might assume that, that if Jonah were to answer that question, he might have answered it by saying something like, oh no, God should not be, care, not, God should not be concerned by the Ninevites. God, they're, they're, they're the enemies of the people of God. They're, they're, they're not worth anything. God, they should be destroyed. Who cares about them? But Jonah doesn't answer the question. The story ends with God asking Jonah, should I not be concerned about them? And Jonah doesn't answer the question because Jonah is not the person who is supposed to answer the question. The person who is supposed to answer the question is the person who is hearing this story or reading this story. God may have asked Jonah, and Jonah might have responded to that question, no, God shouldn't be concerned with the Ninevites. But for the readers and the hearers of this story, they are required to answer that question, and the implied answer for them is, well, yes, God should be, care God should be concerned for the Ninevites. And see, that's where the true power of this story comes in. It's when the readers or the hearers of this story must answer that question for Jonah that we then step into Jonah's shoes and we become a little bit like Jonah. Which then means we are all confronted with the question, well, who are the Ninevites in our life? Who are the Ninevites in our life? The point of the story of Jonah is that every person hearing this story must ultimately see themselves as Jonah. And when we see ourselves as Jonah, we are then confronted with our own prejudices, our own hatred of the other, the, our fear of the other, of the people who are not like us. We are confronted with our own desire for the destruction of our enemies rather than the redemption of our enemies. The truth of this story is that on some level, we are all Jonah. On some level, we all see somebody as those people who are different than, the, than us. And we all see somebody with the eyes that wishes for their destruction, not for their redemption. Now we might joke and say, oh yeah, we see Republicans or Democrats that way. But I think the bigger challenge is that do we see ISIS that way? Do we see Boko Haram that way? All of us have some part of us, whether we want to admit it or not, that looks at people who are different than us and wishes for God's destruction for them. Which means that all of us must answer the question. Should God not be concerned for them too? There are several key messages to this story. One of which has to do with this whole theme of repentance and a need for all people to turn back to God. Perhaps more significantly though is the message that God does in fact care about every single person on earth. And that God's ultimate desire is for their redemption, not for their destruction. Repentance in this story is most certainly called for from everybody in the story. But contrary to what Jonah wants, mercy is also extended to anybody who wants it. Anybody. The people who would have first heard this story would have been the ancient Jews in the several hundred years before Jesus lived. And in that day and age, there really was a stream of Jewish thought that would have said, no, you know what? We really are God's people, and everybody else can just burn. We're the ones who matter, and nobody else really counts. Everybody else is doomed for destruction. And for the original hearers of this story, this would have been a powerful message. 
that contrary to their belief, God does in fact care about everybody. And I think that for us today, the story of Jonah is just as powerful as it ever was. For us today, when we read this story, we must take on the role of Jonah. We are the ones who must answer God's final question in this story. We are the ones who must ask, who are the Ninevites for us? And we are the ones who ultimately must grapple with the question, should God not be concerned for them too?